interesting discussion starting yesterday uh, at the end of the, the, the session. And I would like to, to address some of these uh, points, mainly uh, because the, the, the which level of tools we are using to answer, to try to answer some of our questions. And mainly, uh, what happens when we lack information about space? Uh, we have a, a, a set of data that is not geographically anchored. We don't know where it comes from, we don't know who made it, but we just have the object. And that's the idea behind the network of things. Uh, I would like to show you a proposal about how we can map that in the variables of uh, archaeological artifacts. So, um, we are accustomed to make uh, geographical uh, networks, but um, the question when we lack these information is how do we do what uh, are the variables we have, we have to, to, to choose and how does that impact on the results of our networks? It's always the same rule. If we put uh, garbage in, we will have garbage out because the computer will just make a network of it. So we really have to, to uh, ask us a question of what are the variables uh, we are looking for and how does it, uh, uh, how is it creating us a network. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, an old debate, the topological debate, uh, uh, which is century old, uh, and mostly in the Americas it's really important because we lack uh, historical information. So uh, in many cases we have the objects and we don't know where it comes from, we don't have bronze age or all these kind of chronological uh, uh, distinctions. Um, so, uh, this presentation is also a continuation of, uh, uh, of my, uh, my own PhD work, um, in which I was working with uh, Walter from Maldives in Brazil, um, and I've been working with um, two more networks in which I was uh, classifying uh, human figures with uh, two kind of variables. On, on, one, uh, on one hand, uh, morphological variables, and the other hand, symmetrical uh, variables. And I ended up with these two uh, networks, which were talking about the same things, but in two different ways. So the question was exactly how do they relate or do they relate one to the other? Because they're talking about the same thing. So normally, there should be some kind of connection between them. Uh, and my first idea was to well, just merge these two networks. But then I got this kind of thing, which is really nice, but how would I possibly understand anything? Because it's all uh, uh, interconnected, it's really dense, and um, it's really hard to get any idea, even with some very limited measures, uh, of what exactly is coming out of it. So it's messy and hard to interpret it. So uh, we try to, to, to find another solution. Uh, if we think about these two uh, networks as dimensions, and if we could maybe apply the same mechanism we have in multivariate uh, analysis. Um, that is to fold these two dimensions into a new one. And well, we can do that using the topology. If we have uh, uh, two mode networks, each of these clusters is a combination of variables. And we have a different, uh, a very precise number of possible variations. Um, so, the figures in one cluster might be related to uh, other clusters in the other dimension. And that's why, that's what we are trying to, 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 to build into the, the new, the new uh, folding network. What we get is a network of these combinations of variables. Um, in the first one, the brown one is the, the morphological and the blue one is symmetrical. Uh, uh, network. So it shows us how uh, all particular clusters are related one to the other. And that's the idea we use as a starting point to get to a new, uh, another kind of uh, analysis or another kind of 
of materials uh, using lithium artifacts, also from Brazil, and using the idea of Chen Opératoire, which we've been talking about uh, yesterday, um, which is really useful because it is a, a, a set of dimensions which are sequential. So we have really a sequence of here, just four, but can be, could be really, really longer, of four uh, dimensions, raw material procurement, technology use, and discard, which are sequence, sequence here. You cannot use before, uh, you can use it at another before having its raw material. Um, so we've been using uh, material from the Chapelle Guarani, which is in the same region, northeast of Brazil. Uh, it's kept at the university I'm working at. And uh, it's really a small amount of, uh, of lithic material, only uh, 82 pieces. And we've been using the same method of uh, three two mode networks with uh, Boolean variables, uh, true, uh, true or false. So we have the first network of raw material, uh, classified uh, um, the integrity of the, the raw material and texture. Uh, transformation. We had a uh, unique uh, um, impact, a multiple impact, presence of the cortex, and uh, the angulation, the, the smallest angulation. Uh, and third, this card, we had uh, more um, um, size variables, thickness, length, and uh, width. So, again, we had the question of how we could uh, transform that into a new network and the idea was using hypergraphs. Um, why hypergraphs? Because hypergraphs have the ability to link not only just two vertices, vertices but three, four or even ten vertices. So we can create a graph uh, where we have these at least yes, three dimensions. Um, for that we use the incidence matrix um, where we had, we had the combination of variables in the, in the columns and the artifacts in the, in the rows. There is a one when each, uh, each artifact is uh, matching this, this combination of variables. So every, every, one, every artifact has three, one, and rest in zeros. Um, from this matrix, we transformed it into, into two squared matrix, uh, which is necessary to build a, a, a network uh, using the IGRAF packaging part. And the result is here. Yeah. So this is the network we we obtain uh, crossing these three three smaller networks. Uh, here we have fiber edges. Fiber edges are connecting two uh, two or more, more variables. Um, each fiber edge is represented at least by one node, uh, but mostly by uh, a cluster of nodes. We can see that the network topology uh, is really classical. We have a center, a core, and a periphery. And we see that some clusters, here are the, the, the two most important clusters with eight, eight artifacts each, uh, might be placed all at the, at the core or somewhat at the periphery. Uh, so that's an interesting observation is that the number of figures, the number of objects doesn't uh, isn't related to this location into the network. We might have a uh, important cluster at the periphery and uh, really uh, unique pieces at the set of the core. Um, and we applied also uh, central measure to each of these trajectories, so uh, the combination of variables in the three dimensions. Um, we have like degree closeness between us and our eigenvector centrality. And we can make a few observations. First is that we really have, if you look at between us, we really have a core and a periphery uh, where uh, the core is really, uh, 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 has really high between us and the periphery, uh, very low between us. Um, we also see that the, 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 the core is mainly characterized by this kind of raw material, um, um, it amounts to 41 uh, pieces, roughly the half of our collection. Um, and we also see that uh, despite having the same number of, of objects, 
these three clusters can be uh, distinguished one, of, one from the others. Um, um, the main difference between them is TR uh, transformation 5 and transformation 7, which is the presence or the absence of cortex in the flake. Um, we also have the same differences in the periphery. So we really end up with a tool that allows us to map these uh, um, multiple dimensions into a new network that doesn't exist, doesn't, uh, uh, it's not built uh, from um, real measures, observation, it's really a combination of measures. But we can fold these dimensions into a new network that reflects us some characteristics that we can use uh, archaeologically. Um, so this network doesn't give us answers, straight answers as to uh, which where is the vision of a for an example, but uh, it makes us um, able to analyze some of these questions uh, not just on a, on a, on a very dense uh, network, but from simpler networks that we can uh, articulate together. Along with this, we have new questions. Um, if topology and centric measures are related to specific variables, what does it tell us? What does it tell us about them? What are these? Uh, what does it mean um, from these combinations of variables? We've seen that the, the, the core of the network is related to a single kind of, of raw material. And second, do these topologies point uh, to a chain of how do we understand them in archaeological terms? So uh, that's what we were asking yesterday. Uh, we can use um, these mechanisms, we can use these analyses, but how does it end up? Uh, how does it end up in archaeological terms? Uh, because the computer will always give us an answer. We have to understand what it means in the archaeological report. Um, so that's mostly it. It's just a, a, a starting uh, work. We have to go back now um, in two directions. First, we have to use another collection, another analytic collection, where we have already defined the chain of Benatois to see if this kind of work matches what has been doing, what has been done uh, in traditional means. And so we have to go back to rock art um, with this new tool in order to try to understand the question of the multiple scales uh, that we always have, and we had in the, in the case of Atlantic rock art. Um, how do we articulate multiple scales? Uh, how do we understand the relation between each of these dimensions? And how we can produce uh, a network analysis to match each of these. Thank you.